Good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Church in Greeton, California. We're at 2695 Brush Street. Please, 11 a.m. every Sunday morning, come and join us if you're in the area. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. I hope you're there too. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be the war. to follow along with the pastor. Uh, he's going to be, I think, in 2 Thessalonians. i go ahead and open up to the Thessalonians. Give you a second to find it. 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. What a fellowship. What a joy. Amen. Leaning 
on the everlasting arms of the Lord God Almighty. Remember what it says in Deuteronomy 33, 27, that God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, the everlasting arms of Jesus Christ. My dear friend Jerry is in hospice right now at his house, and um, he's actually been doing really, really well after 10 days of not eating anything. Uh, he actually was able to get up and stand. He's been on the phone every day talking with people about the Lord God. He's been evangelizing them and sharing with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody who comes to visit that he's not sure whether or not they know the Lord or not, he's sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even in his, in his dying breath, in his last breaths. Hopefully he'll be around for a little while longer so he can do some more evangelizing. Uh, I hope that each and every one of us is right out there with him, evangelizing with every one of our sentences that we will remember that. It could be the last time we ever see that person. Let's share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ so they, too, can enjoy the wonderful peace that only comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. So the pastor's sermon is out of 1 Thessalonians. Pastor. Good morning. Hope you're having a pleasant day today. Well, we're going to uh, do something a little different. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians today. We're looking at chapter 5, verses 12 through 22. We're going to be talking about following the will of God, which for a lot of people might be different than following their own will. So when we, we look at uh, the first and second Thessalonians, we notice the church there in Thessalonica did have a few issues. They, they um, had members of the church who were being rebuked for not working or doing their ministry. They were just waiting around for the second coming of Christ. So it's kind of like, well, he's going to be here any day now, so why should we do anything? That kind of uh, situation. Uh, the problem is uh, a, a day to God may be a thousand years to us, as Peter tells us. So they were just uh, being rebuked, for and, for, and the rebuke they got was not very tactful. And have you ever known somebody who's blunt when they talk? If you don't know them, you might actually take offense because you think it's something about you or that they're judging you or being critical of you, and they're just that's just the way they talk. And that's sometimes how Peter talks when he, not Peter, but Paul talks when he writes. Uh, he points to this church to also suggest that the leaders need to have patience and be considerate. Um, and, and overall, the, the, the letter tends to have a theme about being, and these verses, about being thankful. So, you, you know, Paul does this a lot. He'll, he'll write with you, criticism, or build you up, but then you'll be thankful for what is going on. So he, he does credit what is being done properly. So one of the things we find here is that we need to be more patient and loving to others. There's no limit of improvement that we have and need to make in those departments. And the central idea of these verses is that we need to follow God's will. It's very easy to replace God's will with ours, but in doing so, we're making God number two in our lives. So we need to be sure we're following God's will, and he is number one. You ever know somebody doesn't go to church because they have company? We've had people put us up, and we've done prison ministry throughout the United States. And if it's a Sunday we're spending over at their house, they invite us and actually ask that we go to church with them. They don't cancel church when they have company. They still go, but bring their friends as guests. And we've always been honored to go to their church. We actually learn a quite deal being, my wife and I both being uh, pastors, we learn when we visit other churches. But the thing is, uh, open your Bibles. We'll be talking following God's will to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll be starting off with verse 12. And what we see here is we're going to show respect for our leaders as well as being kind to each other. They go hand in hand. If, if you're disrespectful to the church leaders, then you're probably going to be disrespectful to everyone else as well. So we need to tie them together here. And that's what, that's what Paul does. 
verses 12 through 15. Now we ask you, brothers, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, and to regard them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. We exhort you, brothers, warn those who are irresponsible, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. See to that no one repays evil for evil for evil to anyone, but always purse what is good for one another and for all. So we need to treat each other as Jesus instructed. That's really what he's saying. Love one another. Love your neighbor. That's what Paul is saying here. Now, little is known about this church in Thessalonica, but we can infer from the verses and the way Paul writes that, that there were some, some issues. Uh, one of which is we're not to respect people just because of a position. We're to show appreciate and respect for them for the work they do and, and, and the example of how love works we get from our leaders. It's not just being a pastor one should respect me. It's like, what am I doing? Am I really being a pastor? really doing what God calls me to do? Am I really ministering a, a church or to others? Now, love does involve discipline. So if somebody's not doing something right, they need to be disciplined. This is showing love. And good leaders will have good followers. You lead by example. But those who are not good followers will reject or gossip about their leaders, even if they are good leaders. Now, one thing to offer suggestions to is, is, is to be looking at work that needs to be done. And it's quite often we find people who say, hey, this needs to be done over here. Oh, hey, look, over here, you need to go do this over here. Or, hey, you over there, you got to go do some stuff back here. Um, one of the things we need to look at, though, is when you are seeing work that others need to be doing, it could be that God is calling you to do that work. Generally, he doesn't need a middleman to convey his messages to you unless you're a prophet. So it's another thing to realize that God may be revealing work that needs to be done, but it may be work that you need to be doing, not creating more work for others. Frequently, we don't know how much work others are really doing. A worship leader they don't just put five minutes into this, open up a hymnal or some modern day music off of Caleb or some other Christian station and say, okay, we'll do this and they're done in five minutes. They may have hours and hours invested in that, trying to tie it into a sermon, which the pastor, such as in my case, did not get to the worship leader till last night, which gives them very little time because of various things in my life. I was six days late at starting the sermon. But the thing is, there's a lot of work in there. And and uh, we had some work to my mom's house. She is uh, house bound or homebound due to health and age. And so I was unable to start the sermon earlier and actually had a church member come and help at her house yesterday. And I told him, I says, this is what needs to be done. I'm going to be over here working on a sermon. So he got to see on and off during the day that it took me about eight hours to put this sermon together. And I, or actually more, I guess more honestly, be about five or six hours. But the, the thing is, I, I pointed out to him, I said, this was an easy one. Because I'm rewriting one totally from scratch. Research was done back in November of 2008 when I gave it the last time. If I was doing this from scratch, you could add another four or five hours of research. And a lot of people don't realize that's what a pastor does for a 20 to 30 minute sermon. He may have eight hours in that. So we need to understand that many of us that are in ministry do a lot that you don't see. Uh, have you ever known someone who finds work for others but don't do any work themselves? Now many people will criticize someone about the work they're doing but not participate in the solution. This includes having love and respect for pastors or pastors' wives. Or the pastor's wife is also a pastor in the same church. It's a double, double-edged situation. Uh, and this, this church, we actually have three pastors. Maybe tiny, but we have three pastors. And, and their, their calling to be such has been very obvious. But what does respect for pastors mean? It means having an intimate appreciation for them. Not flippant. And respect for them for their value. 
Now, pastors primarily have three roles. There's many others. A small church includes electrical repair, parking lot repair, termite eradication, electric, you know, all kinds of stuff, plumbing, all kind of roof repair, all, uh, all kinds of things they don't teach you in seminary. They need to have a class on being a small church pastor which shows all the handyman stuff. But the thing, thing is, the primary roles is, is that they labor the church frequently close to exhaustion. They stand before the flock to lead them into righteousness. And as teaching and preaching the truth of Scripture, to, to, to move them along to how God wants them to live. And they need to rule with love, which means you got to do some church discipline. When somebody's doing some stuff that's really out of line, scripturally, it needs to be dealt with. No, we don't throw the person out. We're, our, our, our purpose is to restore them gently to the body following God's will. That's the purpose. The goal is to restore somebody. And we need to teach God's truth and correct false teaching. And, and when you're dealing in, in uh, Protestant churches, a lot of people have had upbringings and other churches or denominations, including the same denomination uh, that you might be in, that have been taught doctrine rather than the truth. Doctrine's not always truth. So we need to be able to teach God's truth and correct false teaching. Paul gives us seven instructions for life in the church in these passages. Uh, we'll be at peace with our leaders. Our pastors do work for God. And as a special servant, they're not to be abused. Leaders are not to abuse their authority either. They are, they are not to promote dissensions or disrespect those they rule over in the Lord. They're to the, the warn about those who are idle. Warn them. Say, hey, you need to be doing something here. Uh, they may just have a, a gift of prayer. So are you praying for, for the church? The whole church is responsible for a correct one who is or has become lazy, which is shown by them not doing the Lord's work. Uh, and, and we're to encourage the timid. We don't reject them, but we're to help them. They need to be comforted. Help the weak. These are primarily those who are spiritually and morally weak, and they need to be disciplined and guided. Uh, and there's to be no retaliation. As Christians, we are to forgive each other. This means we that we are not to get even with those we have issues with, which includes gossiping about them. You ever hear two wrongs do not make a right? Well, that's true. We are to be patient, which means forgiveness and acts of goodness. If someone's offended you, is it something you can overlook? They took your parking place. They didn't say hi. You don't know what's going on in their lives. Somebody may have just died. They may have just been fired. They bank account may have suddenly vanished. All kinds of, with internet banking, all kinds of things happen. Well, I kind of like it when extra money turns up in my accounts. Uh, finally, we're to be kind to each other, which is showing an interest in the well-being of another person. That is, we don't rejoice at their, at, at their misfortune, but rather we, we want to help them through it, and we, we, we ought to be grateful for the good things that happen. Now, when was the last time you showed respect to your church leaders or each other? I mean, intentionally made a point to show respect to them. See, many people don't understand the amount of work that church leaders and others do. So how do you show appreciation for their work? Now, the Apostle Paul explains this in Romans 14, verses 16 through 18. Therefore, do not let your good be slandered, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ in this way is acceptable to God and approved by men. This is how you're putting it to use, by, by, by showing righteousness, peace, and, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's your application to these verses. God is a spirit of order. If your church is chaotic, you've probably got the other spirit present. Now, this is shown by how we treat each other in church. That is, we're a church of order or disorder. Our behavior shows that. It, it reveals it. Now, Jesus goes a step further by explaining how we're to treat, treat others that we do not get along with. In Luke chapter 6, verses uh, 32 and 33, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do what is good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. So how do you show the love of God to those who have issues with you? Or you have issues with? Now as we move on, we're going to see that we're to rejoice in the Lord continuously. This ties in, into, into what Paul is saying here. 
1 Thessalonians verses 16, 17, and 18. Rejoice always, pray constantly, and give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now these are instructions that are being given for a relationship with God. Now think about it. We got three verses in one sentence. And they deal with the believer's inner life, the inner self, their inner being. And we're to be joyful in the Lord at all times. I mean, you can put the fake, uh, phony, pleasant smile on your face, but that doesn't mean what's inside you is happy and joyous of God. We're to be joyous with God inside. And, you know, you might need to tell your face, remind your face occasionally about that. But we're to be joyful in the Lord at all times. And this is a case, even when things are difficult in the church and in the non-believing world, we are to rejoice spiritually. Always. Now the stress in these verses in the Greek language is on joy. That's the center point on this. It's joy. The New Testament church is to utilize the fruits of the Holy Spirit, one of which is joy. We're to pray all the time, every day, in the things we do. We're to pray persistently and regularly. Not just for things for us, but for other people. People coming to Christ, being saved eternally. Our role in that, how can we help? What can we do? Who can you? Who can God or the Holy Spirit bring to us to minister to? Our prayers to God are more than just words. We're to pray out of conviction, out of our hearts. As again, it's not a flippant thing we do. It's out of our conviction. And our daily life is to be full of prayer and obedience to God. This is one of the ways we show that we are rejoicing in the Lord. In all situations, we are to give thanks. Now, being thankful for all things is a trait. Excuse me. Not being thankful for all things is a trait of an unbeliever. Now, just as we give requests to God in prayer, we're to give thanksgiving to God when things uh, go right and when things do not go right. When that is when they go poorly, we still thank God. There may be a lesson that he may be training or disciplining us. He may be preparing us for ministry. Some pastors come from churches that or like a Corinthian church in Corinth, all kinds of issues and troubles. And in being in that church, they learned how to deal with it. They were actually trained for the church God uh, actually calls them to to pastor themselves. That is, it wasn't a church in Corinth that was just terrible with all this bad stuff going on. It was actually a training ground for them to learn how to handle it and the church either can be called to. Because there's nothing in the church of Corinth going on that doesn't usually go on in most other churches. So it's a training field. We don't know what God's timing is. There may be a further revelation of God's glory and what we go through. Paul writes about this in Romans 8.28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Now God gives us valuable lessons from our miseries, from our trials and challenges. We are to welcome these trials as they are from God. Uh, I've told many people that I work with uh, in recovery, in a Christian recovery program I work with, uh, a lot of new people. And that is your misery may become your ministry. Who better knows the misery you came from to help other people that are in that same situation than you who came out of it through Christ, through the work of the Holy Spirit. No textbook can, can, can explain and feel the way you did being there. You were the expert, and God has raised you up through that. Jesus describes this in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice, because your reward is great in heaven, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So if you're persecuted by someone in the church or outside the church for doing what God calls you to do, remember it's a blessing. And you're in good company with all the prophets who went through the same stuff. So in all situations, we are to give thanks. Now you show you're following God's will by rejoicing when you are persecuted. Now, Paul has learned that joy and affliction go hand in hand. Without this comparison, neither would be easier to define. I mean, if you don't have the comparison of, of, of uh, 
affliction and joy, it'd be hard to know which is which. So by having both in your life, you do have the comparison. We're instructed that even when being afflicted and persecuted, we are to rejoice in the Lord. Since three of the fruits of spirit of the of the fruits of spirit that Paul tells us about are, are love, joy, and peace, these should be displayed by us and to others by our behavior and attitude. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. There you go. Would you love to have a person just like that living next door to you? When we pray, we should have the same attitude. The attitude should be one of gratitude all of the time. Now, finally, we look at verses 19 through 22, where you see we see we are to believe the prophecies in God's book as well as correctly following the scripture. It's more than just following scripture correctly. We need to believe in the scripture. We need to believe in the prophecies. There's over 400 about who Jesus is, any two or three of which are mathematically uh, greater than all the stars in the universe. Here's Thessalonians 19 to 22, chapter 5. Don't stifle the spirit. Don't despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. That wraps up what he says in the previous verses. See, Paul is instructing us to follow the teachings of the prophets and follow the teachings of the scriptures. Now, it's sometimes said that we, we are not only baptized with the Holy Spirit, but with fire. That is, the Holy Spirit is a burning presence inside us. Now, Paul will mention in his writings 18 spiritual gifts mentioned uh, in the various books. Now, these are given to us for ministry and for the church body, for uplifting the church body. But remember, they didn't have computers back then, and they didn't have a lot of things we have today. So those spiritual gifts may actually be enhanced by the changes in society. There may be more such as uh, a spiritual gift of dealing with electronics. And uh, though they're seeing us here, we've had numerous electronic problems this morning just before this, this sermon or recording going on. And everything was perfect last Sunday. Nothing was touched. And today it was one thing after another not working. Some people have the spiritual gift of working with that stuff and fixing it. In our case, we, uh, we took to prayer and it seemed to resolve the problem which is probably the first place to go. Uh, but the thing is, our uses in God can be smothered by being lazy, immoral, or in participating in other sins. A mechanical attitude towards worship that discourages the use of spiritual gifts of the congregation can result in loss of spiritual benefits. If our service is just mechanical, then we cease being spiritual. So we need to be sure we are spiritual in everything that we do. We don't do things out of just ritual, but ritual with meaning and spiritual purpose. The same can be said for refusing to let people use their spiritual gifts. If God uses the Holy Spirit to give us a gift for a purpose, who are we to tell God, no, we're not going to take that. We don't like it. We don't like this about it. We don't like this qualification. I've had people actually come back and tell me that I could never be a pastor. For a lot of reasons. Well, I've been here 13 years, three seminary degrees, so I think God had the last say in that. So the thing is, we are to listen to the prophecies and not hold them to contempt. Putting the prophecies contempt, uh, refusing to let people uh, use their spiritual gifts, can put it put out the fire of the Holy Spirit in a person. In other words, I have seen people who left ministry because of the way they were treated. Just totally, they're done. I, I, the pastor who baptized me back in 2002 left the ministry about five years later. And he's never returned. He's actually walked away from the church, God, everything. I had a long talk with him about that. and I haven't talked to him since then. I've been able to find him. But it does happen. The fire can be put out. And he, by the way, is a really good prophecy. He's got some really incredible ministries going that are still going today. So we are also not to falsely prophesize. Rather, we're to honestly teach and preach the written revelation from God. We're not to take God's revelation and scripture lightly. 
We are to take the word of God seriously and we're given a caution to teach or rather search the scripture to see if what we're being taught or teaching others is being done so correctly. Remember, the only scripture is the Holy Bible. I see lots of people bring me books and say, hey, Mike, read this. It talks about this over here. Or, I'll read this one. It refutes this in the scripture. And I simply tell them, I said, look, you know, I'm taking care of a, a homebound mom. I run a business and I'm in ministry. Only time I have for reading is God's word in the scripture and the research behind what I do in sermons or teaching Bible studies. Mm -hmm. I don't have time for all these little books. And someone really insisted that I look at one. And I said, okay, I'll look at it. I went online, looked at about five pages. And I called them up and said, thanks. I'm not going to buy it or even read it. Because in the first five pages, he didn't use a single footnote to show where he got any interpretation or, or premise. As a matter of fact, he treats his own opinion as, as, as fact. That, if I was teaching another seminary class, would be an F because it needs to be verified. And there was no verification. I've seen that in lots of books. So any prophecy we are to believe must be in agreement with God's word. And we're to use the prophecies, or rather when we see them, we're to put them into full examination if they are to see, are they really from God? We're to use discernment rather than just being gullible. We're not to be like seekers wanting to hear something we want to hear, uh, looking for a relationship with God like a child who gets tossed to, uh, to and fro with every false doctrine. We need to be grounded correctly in the truth. And we're to avoid every kind of evil and anything that tries to take us and you away from the Holy Spirit. In other words, we are not to be deceived. Now, you show the fire of the Holy Spirit has not been extinguished by the ministry you're in. If you're in ministry, if you're doing things, as I say, you could be a prayer warrior. You could be someone who encourages others to come to their churches. All kinds of ministry. And prayer warrior, maybe just somebody who's at home and you pray for the church. You pray for people doing things or you pray for God's intervention here. That's a prayer warrior. We, we, all different types of ministries. But by doing what God calls you to do shows that, you're, that the Holy Spirit has not been extinguished within you. So we put out the fire of the Holy Spirit by our sin or refusing for any reason to do the will of God. And sometimes the situation where a church body or a leader just stops from using their spiritual gifts. You just walk away and say, I'm tired. Either way, it will put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. And if you're doing what God calls you to do, you're not going to be exhausted. He will always provide the energy and means to do your calling. So we're not just to read the Bible, put it into action in our lives. We're to put it into action, not just read it. We're not to be taken in by uh, suckers or ass suckers uh, by non-believers who will discourage us from doing God's will. And there's plenty out there to discourage you. Remember what P.T. Barnum once said, there's a sucker in every crowd. There's something else he also said. There's a sucker born every second and two to take them. That applies to us in ministry and as believers in Christ. There's always somebody out there. There's, there's more of them than us who will want to take us out of what, our belief, our faith, and our ministry. Don't listen to them. So we're to put everything to test so as not to be misled, and we need to investigate, and we're to stay away from the appearance of evil. If something's in question, it's probably wrong. That's why it's in question. So we're to show respect to our leaders as well as being kind to each other. We're to, be, to rejoice in the Lord continuously and we're to believe the prophecies in God's book as well as correctly following the scriptures. My challenge you this week is show how, how uh, you demonstrate how you respect other believers and church leaders. May God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Michael. That was just spoke to me. Thank you. Excellent, so excellent um, word of God delivered. Uh, and I cannot re, I must reiterate uh, the importance of reading the scripture and taking it for what it is, the truth, and not taking everything that you read in a little booklet or a pamphlet or in a book that's a bestseller, especially if there's no references to the scripture. And a lot of times, even if there are references to scripture, 
they're, they're not necessarily uh, agreeing with the point that person is trying to make. So, yeah, if you have time, if you don't have a whole lot of time because you're doing ministry or because you're busy with work or in a living, uh, let me suggest that you only read scripture. Only read the good book. All right. Have a blessed day, and I look forward to seeing you guys all next week. All right. Bye.